So I'm Carrie Kenya. I'm the creative director for Iconic Images, um, and I'm here to talk to Chris Duppy, who literally, quite literally, was born into this in many ways. You, you practically were born with a camera in your hands, and you are going to speak about a really kind of a unique perspective, and, and probably the most unique perspective um, of anyone that I can think of, certainly, in terms of... Uh, not only your relationship, but your family's relationship with uh, David Bowie. Um, and I thought we would just start at the beginning. And um, so when you were born, how, how soon was it before the music started to hit your ears? Well, first of all, likewise, I'd like to thank all the staff because I think they've done a tremendous job. And actually, I'm very honored to be here on David's what would be his 75th birthday and it's, it's quite extraordinary to think I actually met David round the corner when they were recording or he was recording Aladdin Sane uh, 49 years ago it's just it's just so hard to believe that time's gone I was 17 and I was thinking about it because David was 26 you know you think about that it just seems so young and what talent what I mean he'd already made he, so many he, albums what he accomplished already yeah. at that point yeah is, is exactly astonishing. yeah e extraordinary yeah. yeah so that kind of puts it in perspective for me but um but yes obviously i was born into uh a photographic world um and like anything in life you you get acclimatized to the norm of what is i mean i think you know when i had conversations with duffy about the people that he photographed and the, uh, and the time he said you know the 60s were like a handful or two handfuls of of people and everyone mixed whether it was john lennon michael kane uh, mary kwan it was that you know now we've got this celebrity culture where and it goes down a b c d everyone is from reality tv but um i don't think anyone was really precious about their celebrity status they were just creative people wanting to be involved in creating whether it was music or film uh, or clothes Vidal hair whatever you know and uh, so I grew up in that environment um, Michael Caine would pop round and have dinner John Lennon uh, Duffy was very good friends with John um, and I never really thought much about it um, so it, it just became part of the the kind of um facial of my existence really um, did you just think dad had a cool job or this was part of his work environment no i just thought it colleagues? was his work yeah. Yeah. yeah and i mean again photographers i think you know once antonioni came out with with blow up it huh. changed the whole photographic scene everyone thought that's cool fast cars women money that's what i want to do but i think up until that point in the 50s i mean i know when my dad said to his dad i want to be a photographer his father was like what you know you got to get a proper job that's just insane so um so yeah it would it just everything seemed fairly fairly normal and um i was very privileged but like i say it didn't seem any different from you know any anyone else's upbringing really so when did you start working um, with the, with your dad and with the lab and, well, and what he was yeah, doing? Yeah, I was given a camera at 11, a little Kodak, um, uh, not an Instamatic, it was like a brownie, mm. and just took pictures of my brothers and sisters and uh, it was nothing that interesting really. It was only um, when I'd left home and uh, the first job I had was working in a photo lab and you kind of get that pretty quickly. There's a machine, basically clients bring in film into the front foyer and you take them out the back and you go in the dark room and you put them on this machine that's got a big arm that goes through these tanks. And that's about the whole process really. They come out through the drying cabinet and you cut them up, put them in sleeves and take them out the front again. But what fascinated me was actually um, the content when I was cutting them up I was just looking at these pictures and of course you know it was a commercial lab so there was food there was cars there was fashion there was a whole array of different subjects and it, I, I kind of thought what well, I know how the film's processed that's pretty easy how do you get an image on the film well my dad's a photographer I'll, so 
I'll go work for him. So I called him up and said, can I have a job? And he said, no, I got two assistants. I don't need another assistant. So I kind of pestered him for about three or four months. And um, uh, actually that was kind of bad timing because it was at that very period when Duffy had shot, was shooting a lad insane. And I missed out on that session as an assistant by about three or four months. Um, although I'd met that David at that point was coming around for dinner and like limo would pull up outside and uh, Duffy and he would engage in their own little universe of art speak and um, creativity. Um, but I finally landed a job. Duffy said, okay, well, I'll take you on, but all I can offer you is you sweep floors and make coffee. So that's what I did for a year or more. And assistance didn't last that long with Duffy, really. Maybe three months, four months, and like he, he had a short fuse for sure. Um, and so I kind of, I, I remember I, because I'd worked in the lab and we also did color printing, we had a job on uh, for uh, an advertising agency, Fort Cone Building in, in, in uh, Baker Street, and he'd fired the printer an assistant and like the agency needed these prints and I said well I can color print so I jumped in and that was my first kind of step up um, after another year I was running the studio and I just traveled the world with him and it was a, a such an extraordinary period because I think um, and Duffy always said to me you are the last generation that will be um, what will be called with working with photographers who were general practitioners really because one day we'd be shooting portraits of the Sunday Times then we'd be in Paris shooting Fashion for Elle magazine then we'd be in the Bahamas shooting a Clara lad then we'd be in Scotland shooting a, a, a Citroen commercial and so it was a mix of everything and I think since the explosion of popularity of photography and photographers there's so many now there's not enough work and everyone becomes very um, compartmentalized if that's a word where it's like okay well there's a lot of people doing fashion I'm not very good with people maybe I'll do food well there's a lot of people doing food uh, I'll do fruit well Joe Bloggs he does a lot of bananas and he I'll do kiwis you know what I mean people become really so that whole period of being very eclectic um, is it doesn't exist anymore so um, and of course it was an analog period and Duffy was always wanting to push the boundaries on every technique, every lighting technique, every processing technique. And again, photographers at that period had their own studios, which now doesn't exist. It's a, it's a, a total rental um, situation. So, and photographers had their own little secrets because they could, you know, they had it in their studio, their own special light, their own whatever. Um, so I learned a tremendous amount of working for Duffy. I didn't actually realize it until I decided, and you have to make that jump, okay, um, if you're a photographic assistant, what's the end game here? You're gonna, you wanna be a photographer, okay? But it is a massive jump because everyone knows you as an assistant, and one day you have to say, right, I'm gonna be a photographer, and you step out, and you gotta earn a living, okay? So I left Duffy, and I did a bit of freelance, assisting through um, uh, the what's called the Association of Photographers now. It was AFAP then. And actually in the book, the Five Sessions book that I put together, um, if you've read it or you will read it, it's the, the section about Tony DeFries, who was David's manager, uh, basically put the association together. But anyway, they had a section where they would uh, put assistants together with photographers. And I worked for half a dozen people and I realized very quickly that I couldn't learn anymore. I'd learned everything I needed to with, with Duffy. Um, and so I stepped out and uh, I worked nights. I remember working on nights in uh, the Valbon nightclub uh, in the cloakroom there, working till four in the morning. I had various other jobs working for the Manchester Evening News and whatever, just to kind of get by so that in the day I could get out to agencies, I could get to magazines and show a portfolio. So, um, and actually we, we were talking earlier, uh, Jamie here, who I haven't seen since 1983, we were talking about a period when 
you know, we just used to shoot stuff just to get pictures in your portfolio. There was a massive sense of enthusiasm and just energy and creativity. And it was never really about the money, you know, it was just, you know, creating great pictures. Um, so I stepped out then and, and again, you know, a unique period where you could call up a magazine and say, can I bring my portfolio in? I don't think that happens at all now. I mean, fashion editors won't see anybody, advertising agencies. You could call up an art buyer in, in, in Saatchi's and go, oh, my name's Chris Duffy, I shoot fashion, and beauty and food or whatever. And they go, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll sort some appointments out for you. And they come back to you with half a dozen art directors you could see. You might never get a job off them, but you could get out and you could meet people and see people. And so I started to um, cut my own way. And also at that time, my generation, I'd come to, I would, you know, I had this kind of dual interest with photography and also with music because at school, everyone was obsessed with music. Everyone was playing an instrument, you know, and everyone wanted to be in a band. And did people in your school and, and your friends, did they know your, um, uh, you know, aff affiliation and your connections that your that Duffy had? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I guess, I, although I don't think it really connected with anyone, you yeah. know, at that age, 15, 16, 17, it was, you know. Um, but so I had this moment where I'd taken these test pictures of these twins Camilla and Carrie, and at the end of the session, uh, I said, what are you doing? And Camilla said, um, I'm going to go and meet my boyfriend down at the Queen's Pub in Regent's Park. Do you want to come? I said, yeah. So I went down, and her boyfriend was there, uh, a guy called Danny Kleiman, who is now the world's biggest commercials director. He does all the uh, sequences for the Bond films as well. Um, and he's, I connected with him immediately. He had a set of winkle pickers on that were like this long and his hair greased back. And uh, we got on immediately. And um, I said to him, or he said to me, he'd got this band called Bazooka Joe. Adam Ant was the bass player. And I'd, I'd been at school with Adam. And uh, Bazooka Joe was formed by Adam, John Ellis, who went on to form the Vibrators, um, and then worked with Peter Gabriel a, a tremendous amount. Um, and Danny, and Adam left to uh, set up Adam and the Ants. And so there was a vacancy there. And I said, I've been playing with this blues band down in South London in Wandsworth. It was like these dreadful gigs we had with about three people would turn up, you know. And I said, well, I'll, I'll join. I don't play bass, but I'll take it up, I'll learn. So I became the bass player for Bazooka Joe. And Bazooka Joe, um, their claim to fame was that the Sex Pistols supported us on their very first gig at St. Martin's. And they've actually got a plaque up there. So that was a, a bit of a trip, yeah. Um, so, but I had this duality, because like, am I gonna be like, is music or is photography gonna be my ultimate destiny? And I realized actually that with music, unless you're writing or you're really talented, you're gonna be an amazing session musician that probably wasn't going to last too long, you know, so um, I decided photography was the, the road to take. How long were you in Bazooka Joe? Uh, I was in Bazooka Joe, so that was, I think, 74, 75, 76. So punk, at that point, I mean, punk was really on the streets. We used to go down to the 100 Club, and literally people were dressed in uh, black plastic bags and pins before... Um, uh, Boy or Vivian Westwood um, and Malcolm McLaren started that whole movement. Uh, so it was very raw. Um, and although we got we got classed as punk, we weren't a punk band at all, really. It's just we didn't play extremely well. So we just had like, we had more than three chords, but we were pretty loud. Um, we took our inspiration from American, like, um, uh, do what from Sha Na Na, Frankie Valley, all that kind of stuff, and really punked it up. Um, so I played with Bazooka Joe till about 76, and then uh, the band changed. We formed another band um, called the No Goodniks, which was a kind of uh, pastiche of 
uh, Allen Ginsberg, it was like hip poetry, and so that was a completely different direction. And then at that point, I thought, I just, you know, I don't have time to continue this. So, because my career had started to take off, I was shooting my contemporaries, Adam, um, Sade, I became good friends with Spandau, uh, Ultravox, Billy was a, a, a great friend of mine, the keyboard player, Midjour. Uh, Fine Young Cannibals, um, like all those bands of, of, of that period. So I was, you know, doing my own thing. And uh, it was difficult because everyone thought you're the son of a famous photographer. You're going to naturally, all those jobs are going to be passed on to you. But um, there was only one person who ever gave me a job that worked with my dad. And he's still a friend of mine today, you know. So I really did cut out my own little groove there. Yeah, yeah, and your and your work. Um, I always say it's very different from your father's, but it's it's it has a different perspective and it has a different sort of eye towards what what, what Duffy did. Yeah, I, I mean the eighties were interesting. I think that the that their time hasn't come yet. Much like the sixties is now such in in, in vogue, um, and it was really the embryo of pop culture. If you think about it, uh, teenagers didn't really exist. Uh, up until the 50s, Eddie Cochran, Bill Haley, Elvis, and then that ex cultural explosion that happened. Um, but the 80s were very interesting, really. I think the the fashion, the the whole completely, because they come out of punk and then be massively inspired by Bowie, you know, yeah, yeah. all the Bowie kids yeah. from the Blitz. And Steve Strange was well, a great mate I was just going to say, yeah. let's, let's uh, uh, have a moment to talk about Steve Strange. Bless, bless him, Steve, um, yeah. Because you, I mean, not only uh, uh, took amazing photographs of, of Steve, but um, then you had the kind of interesting uh, parallel with Scary Monsters. Yes. And, and yeah. Well, at that point, I would, yes, so I was out taking my own pictures and um, getting my career going. And Duffy had actually come to the end of his, he'd become very disillusioned. I mean, the whole zeitgeist had changed. Photographers, you know, that new generation came in from the late 50s into the 60s where uh, Bailey, Duffy and Donovan were like, let's kick this into shape. We want movement in our pictures. And technology had something to do with that as well because uh, they moved away from formal plate cameras and they had 35 mil and they could make girls run and jump. And so the whole dynamic changed in the, in, in the look of fashion pictures. Um, so photographers had tremendous power because and even, I mean, you can look at, I can identify a Sarah Moon, a Guy Bourdain, a Helmut Newton, uh, a Bailey. I know what those pictures look like. And photographers got commissioned because they wanted a Bailey or they wanted a Sarah Moon or they wanted a Duffy. I honestly can't tell the difference between anything today. And I, I've sort of given up actually looking at pictures because I just, and not only that, I don't know what a real picture is anymore because that paradigm shift in technology Photograph analog photography deals with a metaphysical condition of a moment in time. You know, that classic Cartier-Bresson, uh, the definitive moment. It's not a fraction of a second before or a fraction of a moment after. And that's what always intrigued me with, with great pictures that I looked at was, how did they get, how did he get that moment, you know? Um, but once you can layer an image and you can pour, uh, mountains in the background a dolphin coming out or what you know whatever you want to add to me it's and i'm not knocking it i mean there's a value in it if it's an image that resonates with you fantastic but to me that's digital imaging it's not photography in the way that i understand it and what excites me so um Oh, I forgot where we were going with that. We were, were talking we? about um, Steve Strange. Oh, Strange, uh, yeah. Stranger, yeah. Well, Strange was a pioneer. I mean, really, you know, he came out of Bridge End in, in Wales, um, sort of mining town, like Chris Sullivan did as well, you know, and they came up to London and just started a movement, the New Romantics, and they kept it very exclusive, and Steve never wavered from... I mean, he'd call me up and say, I've got a great idea. Can we, like, tomorrow night, I've got... Uh, this young model coming in from from New York, and I got Paul Global Global who do the makeup, and Yasmin Lebon, and I'm getting the clothes. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, and we just do pictures again. You know that kind of just energy of like an excitement of just shoot it. it doesn't matter. There's no 
reason for shooting it other than we want to do it. Yeah. Yeah, well, they were all, you know, that, that new romantic moment, too, was yeah. very heavily influenced by yeah. Bowie. Yeah, I mean, that, absolutely. You know, that's very clear, and they, yeah. they've all talked about yeah. what a, a, you know, monumental... Yeah. And David was, 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 I mean, you know, that was David's gift, really, of being able to really hone in on what was happening and be able to kind of just absorb it and turn it into something that he made his own. Yeah, you yeah. Know. I mean, what was that session like? What was the um, the scary monsters? Scary monsters. Well, it was it was a bit. Uh, well, like I say, Duffy had, had given up photography at that point, um, and the studio had become like a workshop with lathes and saws and stuff. So he didn't have a space. He got rid of his staff, and he said, "You know, David's called me. He wants to do." And I had a studio because I'd worked with. Um, John Frieda, or John Frieda, John Frieda worked with Duffy a lot, and his assistant was Nicky Clark, and then Nicky became a great mate of mine, and we were always doing hair shots and beauty shots. And John said to me, my brother's got a recording studio called Matrix in Little Russell Street behind the British Museum, and they've got all the basement, but he's got the lease to the whole property, and he thinks that the ground floor will make a great studio. So I went and had a look and Nigel said, well, if you do it up, you can use it anytime you want and we'll rent it out. I went, fantastic, works for me. Um, the only drawback, drawback with the place was it was right next to the Pizza Express. And like the waft every day of pizzas was, I think I lived in that place before Pizza Express became commercial. They were, um, I think phone. that's my sound thing. Um, they were fantastic. But um, so Duffy said, want to shoot this? Can we use your studio? Will you assist me? So I said, yeah, sure. So we, we shot the session in my studio. And it was, you know, the, the Scary Monster session was, uh, it's an odd one because David obviously asked Duffy because of the previous work. He knew what Duffy could deliver, the way that he thought. And Duffy had identified this painter, Edward Bell, and he said to David, I found this, this fantastic painter. You, you, you want to have a look at his work? So that's how Edward got involved. And then the project got a kind of a bit mashed up, really, because Edward wanted to take control. And Duffy's pictures got, if you, I mean, obviously the, the, the album cover is a painting. And so David loved it. And I think Duffy felt slightly, to know, why, why did you get me involved if you didn't, <clears throat> you know, want to use my stuff? I don't know. I never, I didn't talk to him much about it, but that's what I kind of felt. Um, but in the end, it's come round because those pictures, in a way, yeah. were never seen. And now they've, they've come out, it's given them a whole new lease of life. And they've, they've got, yeah, a thing of their own. Yeah. Well, I mean, all five sessions, um, that that Duffy did uh, is is not only a moment in time, yeah. uh, a, a very specific moment in David's career, uh, but it's an amazing that uh, body of work when you when you look at all five sessions. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's other photographers who've got a tremendous amount of images of of David, much more than Duffy. But I think Duffy's and you know, in life, timing is everything. Ziggy. Although those images weren't used, De Vries was testing out Bailey, um, Sakita, and Duffy in the early days when he was cr setting up his master plan. Duffy and David gelled, and so it went that way. But just so from 72 all the way through to Scary Monsters, I mean, everyone's got their favorite period with, with David. And all of my life, David's been, the, well, practically all my adult life, David's been in the background doing something. I haven't liked everything. I'm sure not everyone likes everything, but people like different parts for different reasons. But I think um, I would call that like the golden years for me. They are like the, the essential, you know, Ziggy was the, the, the launch pad. Aladdin saying was, I'm taking off and now I'm becoming a superstar. And so, you know, Duffy really caught that, those, those iconic moments in that, in that 10 year, nine year period. So and they're all extraordinary stories in their own. Really, they're all so different. Um, Aladdin Sane, which is, has become a world 
icon, the image, is quite extraordinary when you think how simple it is on a white background. And I think maybe that's what, what makes it work, um, is that it's so easy to transpose in one sense onto every, whether caps, iPhone, uh, shirts, whatever. But that said, it's such um, an arresting image. And in period, I mean, incredible. It really shocked people, yeah. you know. We look at it now and it's not that shocking, but you've got to put it in context to the time. Mm -hmm. And um, was it a death mask? Was it, it was just really, whoa, what is this? Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's, it's become synonymous with, with David Bowie. And, it is. You know, yeah. and it's a photo that actually works as a silhouette as much yeah. as it does as an image. Yeah, yeah. Um, and even, you know, yeah. you look at the Bowie 75, the yeah, red and yeah, the blue, yeah. the flash, it, that flash is connected yeah. with it. And yeah. the flash is, is very interesting because, you know, that that's a subject that's always debated. Where did the flash come? But actually, David took that from Elvis because Elvis... Heard, happy birthday, Elvis. Happy birthday, <laughs> Elvis, absolutely. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah, I know. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. But... Um, Elvis had, he was a great gospel fan, but he started a secret society called Templars of the Christian Brotherhood, which was, you know, against racism, anti-Semitism. And he'd shortened that acronym to TCB, taking care of business. And he added on in a flash. And so he had on the back of his jet plane, a flash on the, on the tailpiece, he had, pendants for all his band and people that work with a flash on and so David was fascinated with that and lifted the flash and so when David came to Duffy and said we've got a new album uh, the one element that David gave Duffy was the flash he said it's got to have the flash so there was no preconceived idea of how it would be used and the other interesting thing is that Duffy said to him so what's the album called and he said a lad insane Duffy in his head transposed it, Aladdin Sane. So, because obviously there is no word Aladdin Sane. So, on many fronts, it was a, just a chemistry that was the two men's kind of energies coming together to create. And as I've said before, that moment in time where that one picture was taken that second, that how could anyone have known that that would become, you can't get up in the morning and go, oh, I'm going to go out and create a cultural icon, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just timing on, ev again, timing on everything. Mm -hmm. just and evolves. also time in many ways, you know, I think things become iconic over the course of time. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, all five sessions especially have become, over the, the course of time, iconic. When did you start, because a lot of people don't realize uh, back, you know, in, in the 70s, 60s, of course, that one photo would have been used, maybe two, maybe three, but not the entire shoot. So when yeah. did you start digging through the boxes, if you will? Kevin Cam came to me uh, 2011 and he said, I'm doing a book called Any Day Now that is David's, and it's like an encyclopedia, it's incredible, uh, David's life up to 1973. And so it's gonna end with Aladdin saying, um, have you got any other pictures? Of course, up until that point, the only picture we'd ever seen was the album cover. So I said, well, yeah, come over to the studio. And I met Kevin and got on with him very well. And I put the transparencies out on the light box and his eyes came out on organ stops. He was like, oh my God, you've, like, you've got pictures of David with his eyes open. I said, yeah. He said, oh, can I use these, these images? And I said, uh, I'm not sure. He said, well, David's on board with this. Let me run it by David. So he ran it by David and David said, yeah, that's fine. So I let him use the eyes open and the contact sheet as well, which actually Duffy wasn't very keen on when I showed him. I said, should we do a, because it's, it, it's a mock-up. Two rolls of black and white were shot and I can only assume they were shot for, you know, the back cover is solarized and they used a special technique with a, a black and white film called Ag for Contour. And I think Duffy shot me black and white so that he'd have something outside of the color transparencies to manipulate and play with. But I created this black and white contact sheet and then put the color picture right in the middle because I thought that really popped out. And uh, so 
I think he came round to it in the end and thought it was it was good, and it has been incredibly popular. People love contact sheets, you know, that whole process of how, and particularly as that was the only picture that had ever been seen, it was like, oh, wow, that was the session. Yeah. Well, I think that that's kind of the most fascinating thing about looking at the photographers' work in their archives. Yeah. It's, I mean, it is looking at... Yeah. The tests and the the, the that's, that's journey. My, that's my contact yeah. sheet out of interest. Yeah, <laughs> but you can just see, you know, the movement and what you were trying to do yeah. and what you know what what. It yeah, you know, you've you've hit something interesting there. You know, this chemistry that photographers have. Everyone has a different way of um, creating the image. Derek Bosch said something interesting about Duffy. He said he doesn't take pictures; he creates the space that they live in. He creates that element. It's not just about taking pictures, but if I think of Bailey, Duffy, and Donovan, uh, who obviously, growing up, I was very close to, they were around all the time in the kitchen, arguing and debating about lenses. Was it shot on a Mamiya C3 with a 65 mil, or no, it was all techniques, stuff like that. Um, so I obviously knew them very well, know them very well. David's still alive, Terence passed away, sadly. Um, but Terry was the joker. Terry was the humor. Um, Bailey, you always felt like he had a chip on his shoulder. If he was photographing you, he'd go, is that dandruff? <laughs> right, and you go, oh. he, he put people on their back foot. But that was his technique, you know, to, to create that tension. Duffy was the intellectual. So when I look through the contact sheets of Michael Caine, you can see him going, because they were in full flow of a debate. And that's interesting because when you take a photograph, if I take a photograph of you now, you know what you look like, but somehow it's very intimidating that, what do you want me to do, okay? But if you can erase that kind of relationship between yourself and the camera that's there, and we're just talking like now, and I'm taking pictures, and you're moving, you've forgotten the camera, you get something interesting. And that's why Duffy, his assistants, he got, I mean, he knew exactly what he was doing. He, he knew all the technique, but he always got the assistants to do, he'd tell them what he want with the lighting and he'd tweak it and the F-stops and whatever. And then he would just talk and take the pictures, another roll of film, another roll, and he'd be immersed in. And so when I look at his contacts, you, you see that flow and that's an insight actually in, in, into how photographers or those photographers' work. Every photographer has their own, their own way. Piece of magic. It is. It is. It's about yeah, your personality. Yeah, yeah. Your yeah. and relationships. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, the connection between the subject and the photographer at yeah. that that moment in time. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. some people are easier to photograph than others. Some people. I remember I, uh, a band actually I really like and I still like them. Scritti Politti, and Green, the singer came to the studio and I don't know what had happened he'd had a bad night or whatever but he wouldn't come out of the dressing room and he was terrified and I said to the makeup artist like you know is he coming out and he stood against the wall and it's like you got to get something out of this you know so you got to find some technique to engage and that is something interesting also I, 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 I learned a lot from Duffy was with working in these different mediums the people in advertising are completely different to people in music. They're completely different to people who work in beauty and fashion, you know. You have to understand their, where they're at, their level, and connect with them to get anywhere, you know. So um, part of it is, is, is quite theatrical. You have to kind of play the game when you're working commercially. So that was, that was, that was very beneficial, learning that from Duffy. So you, you've spent um, the last few years, couple of years, uh, really archiving and, and going through everything. Are you still finding surprises? Are you still, still finding, learning? Yeah, what Duffy burnt. I mean, he had a fit of madness when he decided he was going to pack it in. And he came into the studio and an assistant said to him, we've run out of toilet paper. And I think it was just the straw that broke the camel's back. He just fired everyone, said, I'm closing it down, and lit a fire in, a bonfire in the garden and started burning stuff. As it happened, weirdly, Bailey had just come by and dropped in and said to him, like, I'll look after that for you. And he went, no, don't bother. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever 
set fire to film, but it creates thick black acrid smoke. And a neighbor complained from all the smoke and someone from the council got sent round. Like that would never happen today. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't be able to get through to the council. And a guy came round in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Press six for savage bonfires, seven for. Uh, yes. Uh, anyway, this little guy from the council came round, looked over the fence, went, oh, you can't do that, put that out, and Duffy put the fire out. So not everything, thank God, got destroyed. But, um, you know, 20 years of working seven days a week, um, there was an incredible amount of work. And so I know, for example, Lennon, we've got two sessions. Um, I know Duffy did at least eight with him that I don't know where they are. Um, so lots of things disappeared, but um, Ollie, who works for me, is constantly researching. I think we've found about at least 450 magazines we don't have for material, fashion and portraits. And so it's ongoing. I mean, I, we'll never find those, those transparencies on next, so we'll never get high res. But it's, you know, initially I put together, Duffy had um, got a condition called pulmonary fibrosis, which was from his woodworking. When he stopped photography and shooting commercials, he went into becoming a restorer and he managed to get into an association called BAFRA, British Antique Furniture Restoration Association. I think there's only like 90 members in the country and you're accredited. I mean, if the Queen wants to get her Louis XIV side dresser refurbished, she's not gonna look in the yellow pages. So they go to someone from BAFRA. And it took him two years to get in and he ended up lecturing professors. He specialized in finishes. And so he was always messing around, typical Duffy, pushing the boundaries with chemicals. And he'd got this condition called pulmonary fibrosis, obviously from what he was working. And up until that point, I'd always said to him for years and years, you've got to do something with your archive because it was just in boxes underneath the stairs. And he went, one day when I fall off the perch, it's all yours. And I said, yeah, but dad, you know, I don't know half, I work with you half your, nearly half your career, but I don't know a lot about this other stuff. I need some insight into it. And so when he knew he was ill, he said, okay, let's, let's do the archive. So we started on a top level looking through, because I knew he had a limited amount of time, five years best, um, at all the material. And we kind of graded it in five, five star down. So of course, you know, Michael Caine, that's a five star. Uh, Paul McCartney, that's a five star. And so um, it was a race really to get as much produced before he was gonna, you know, check out. Uh, so we're still, yeah, we're still finding things, still finding things. Yeah. You know, you know, when you when you think about it, um, thank goodness you've had that time um, to go through the archive and to get the stories and the antidotes and the the dates and the yeah. the what else you did that we don't have anymore and and you know to have that opportunity to kind of revisit a, a person's life. Yeah. really and and through via their artistic output yeah i yeah. mean yeah we're, it's, it's it's fascinating because we're rebuilding not just his career i mean not, like i say all he works for me is fascinated with with this whole time scale and people that plug in and out of it um just the whole context of that period the 60s and the 70s the movers the shakers the people that were doing things how they've influenced modern uh, culture and society and it is a really fascinating era. I think we live in a space now, you know, technology's changed so much. Everything is available with a Google kind of search on everything. And we've got, we can put lots of facts together. But I mean, the one thing Duffy said to me, he said, when I, when I die, he said, because he had an amazing library. He said, please don't get rid of any of my books. So I've actually got a building with, with his books. And occasionally I go through and look through things and I can see where he's, you know, in some of the art books, he's made notes on things, you know, that's wrong or this, whatever, um, which tells me that he actually read, all, and I know he read all those books, but now, you can just go on Google and it's very easy. You, you skim across things, but you don't really put a cohesive thought process together. If you read books, you build a narrative and you get a viewpoint on things. Yeah. And 
so he was always doing that. And that was one of his incredible um, abilities to be able to, I mean, assisting him. He'd come out with things like you'd be arguing, he'd, he'd start talking about, oh, the key influences on Swedish pottery in the 30s. And you go, how, how do you know all those names? How do you know all that stuff? But he just read incessantly. Mm. And he could jump from one thing to another. Quite an extraordinary brain. Did he, did he have a, a big, uh, besides the books, did he also have a big physical archive in a sense of like notes and letters and receipts? Do you, do you know what I mean? Not of his own, no. Not of his own. He collected a lot of things. His, his record collection is quite incredible. Uh, and books. But not really... Well, he documented, uh, I suppose, not in letters, but he was, a, he was a painter, essentially. That's what he wanted to be. So we've got drawers of his paintings and life drawings. So I guess that's how he documented his... Yeah, yeah. Well, another aspect another to his uh, artistic yeah. output. And when I get yeah. time, when I get sorting the archive out, that will be my next project, is to look at his, that work, really. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what, what's the what's the prospect, prospect that has been for, for you in the sense of um, what you've learned by doing the archive, by, by not only revisiting the archive with Duffy, but then after... What have you come away with learning more about, about what he did and, and his life's work? Well, you know, like I say, I worked for Duffy from 73 to 80, and I was very connected uh, with his thought process. When you work with him, he could be incredibly frustrating because you'd come in the studio and he'd say, oh, I want a soft light there, and you'd spend two hours setting it up, and he'd come in and go, no, throw that all the way, I want it. So I kind of, I knew the way that he he was thinking about how he wanted to approach something and it was always pushing the boundaries so i didn't I haven't really learned anything more through doing the archive i certainly can look at a set of contacts and know the picture that he'd he'd pick because i'm so in tune with his brain and part of that was when we started going through them you know we'd look at a contact sheet and i'd say that's, that's a really good picture, that one, when we were deciding what... He'd say, mm, yeah, it's a good picture, but it's not a great picture, you know? And so it is the way with photography. I've taken pictures all my life, and it's a continuum. It goes for every photographer. You're constantly... It's like a drug. You're constantly trying to get that ultimate picture. And when you get it, or you think you get it, and it's difficult because you become very attached to your own work. I love photographers like Gary Winogrand, who was so broke, he begged, borrowed and stole film all the time. And when he died, I think he had three and a half thousand rolls of film that weren't, that were processed but not contacted, 2,000 rolls that weren't processed. And he'd come back and look at his stuff for when he finally got the money to process it, like five years later. And you can be objective because if I take a picture of you now, tomorrow look at it, go, yeah, that was Carrie yesterday or here these guys a year's time mm, that's interesting that was a year ago 10 years time it's fascinating look at the decor look at do you know what i mean and so time makes a difference in the way that you view certainly your own images um so duffy went through that as well looking at, at because he always uh pinned his contact sheets he turned them over so he'd go through and he had a pen and he'd pin it, turn it over and put a circle on it. And we've still got all the original contact sheets. And when we reviewed them, he'd look at them and saw them in a different way and picked different pictures. Your view changes on that. Yeah. Well, because I think a lot of people don't realize that uh, you did not, at that time, you were busy going to the next job. You yeah. weren't looking back. You were always, yeah. what's next? What's today? What's next yeah. week? What's next month? Like you were always yeah. hustling yeah. for work, for that next assignment. Yeah. So, you know, time... And also, you didn't need that photo. You, you, that was that was last month. Now I'm on to something else. I didn't need, you know, photos of Michael Caine ten years ago. I need what's what I'm doing next week. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, the uh, idea that <clears throat> again, this idea of moving forward, you look back, something becomes really interesting. Duffy said, "I never went out and created art or." wanted to be an artist, you know, didn't have a beret and a easel. I wasn't like, I just went out, I was being paid uh, as a worker to fulfill someone's brief. And it was done, it was like chip paper, next one, 
and you just keep working, you just keep doing it. 20 years later, you know, it's like punk. There was a thousand punk bands out there, okay? 10 years later, the, the cream rises to the top and the best, you know, in any medium, it always comes through. So. Bazooka Joe. Bazooka Joe. Well, it comes back to <laughs> Bazooka Joe. Exactly, yeah, the foundation of my life. Yeah. Well, here we yeah. are talking about Bazooka Joe, so. Yeah. yeah. Had an influence. Yeah. yeah. It's funny because um, Jonathan Barnbrook, who did so much work with David, we met at the V&A over a project, and Jonathan's very laid back. Doesn't say a lot, he's quite quiet. And I don't know how we got on the subject we were talking about it, but Bazooka Joe came up. And I've never seen Jonathan so animated. He went, Bazooka Joe! Bazooka, you were in Bazooka Joe. <laughs> I had to laugh. Yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, we, we could talk for, for days about um, not only your work, but, but Duffy's work. Uh, I do want to open it up to questions because I'm sure people want to talk about specific sessions or memories that you have. Sure. Or even your, you know, re your relationship now with, with, you know, the other collaborators, everyone from Jeff McCormack. Sure, yeah. You're talking about. Yeah, I mean, um, that's been fantastic to yeah. open up this world. Uh, Jeff's become a great mate. And uh, all the people that um, I've, because it started in 2015 with the Bowie Years exhibit. And they <clears throat> came to me and they said, we've had a lot of interest in David Bowie Years. And for a lot of these smaller museums, for money reasons, size reasons, technical reasons, um, we can't give them David Bowie years, but you've got your five sessions. We'll pass you on the contacts and it'd be great if you do your own thing. So I thought that's fantastic. And I suddenly realized that a museum show is a very different offering to just doing a gallery show where you put pictures up, and they've got, gallery's got a client list and you sell pictures. A museum exhibit is educational, multi-leveled, sound, uh, interviews, uh, memorabilia. And so I started putting this exhibit together around the five sessions. And on my travels, I started to interview a lot more people. Carlos Salomar, Mike Garson, Woody Woodwincy, Susie Ronson, the whole gamut. So um, the pandemic has kind of put the kibosh on the show for the moment but as soon as we get through this we will be launching this 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 exhibit um but it's been fantastic just getting the bigger bowie community and that's it you know everyone like all these people that david worked with all a part of a bigger jigsaw of of their life and his life and what he took from them and how he turned it and you know it's fascinating well, and it is, I think it's also a testament to, to him and what he did and, and his relationships with all these other creatives. Yeah. Because I can't think of a single, uh, you know, a, a single other artist who has that sort of community, not only with fans, but but but, but everybody he, yeah. he worked with from yeah. day one. I mean, yeah. his best friends were George and Jeff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, they were, what, six, eight years old? Yeah. When they I mean, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And, you know, what's fascinating also is that <clears throat> David grew organically over the whole period of his career and manifested into these different, from Bad Insane, Ziggy, then White Duke, um, Labyrinth, all these different manifest ma manifestations. Um, and... Um, What's the thread of what I was going to say there? What was what did you say just before that? Uh, that the community is so vast and has been so loyal and has oh, stayed yes, with I know. him. Oh yes, sorry. What I was going to say was that so through that whole process, that I don't think there will ever be another artist that will be able to work like David because today an artist in this digital arena comes up with a song, they have a hit within three months. If they don't have another one, they're dropped. But David managed to just kind of... And so, you know, whenever we, we have an exhibit, we have fans who are like three years old, four years... I mean, it's incredible, all the way through to 80. He touches such a wide spectrum um, of fans. It's incredible. And I think for kids, it's about, you know, scary monsters. It's, it's so theatrical, isn't it? It's so visual. 
It's like just that those constant changes. So, but I don't think you'll ever find another artist that that will develop like David. No, for sure not. It's the end Absolutely. of yeah. Mm. Uh, let's open it up to some questions. You want to start it off, sir? Um, I have a question about uh, the um, the Lad Insane uh, session. There was a limited, rare, collectible um, stamp proof sheet that came as an insert. Um, I note uh, the um, was it the uh, part of the Scary Monsters? Ashes to ashes. Ashes to ashes. Ashes to ashes. Yeah. The, the, the stamp proofs. There was an insert, and uh, it's. Yes, you have a, it's come up on the screen at some point. Um, well, I, I, have, I have them on my wall at home, actually, in LA. And um, there was a couple. There was one with a single, and there was one with the album. Yeah. And it's got sort of, um, it's like a proof sheet with crosses on it, but it's, it, it's um, perforated like a stamp collection. Mm. Well, David did all of that. Oh, I, was, I, say, I was going to say, what's yeah. the story behind Yeah, it? David did that. That was, that, that was an after. Yeah. Oh, yeah, David designed and put that together. So those crosses, because it sort of almost looks like a contact sheet where someone's selecting as a photographer. Yeah. They're selecting the pictures that they like. Yeah. Or crossing out the ones that they don't like. And, and so I, was, I wasn't sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I put together. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That's the thing yeah. yeah. About. That, that's was, that was the single. So yeah, there's, one, there's a couple yeah, yeah, crossed yeah, out. Yeah. And so, um, it, I always wondered what that was about. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I recreated for the 40th anniversary last year um, a set of Duffy's pictures and some of... Oh, this one here. That's so there's mine and Duffy's together, and we put the three pictures that were... That's fortuitous timing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> did you know this was coming? <laughs> um, so, yeah, we tried to recreate that same kind of... Uh, feel with the with, 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 with the singles. Yeah. 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 So I work with the um, Terry O'Neill archive and it's interesting with the David Bowie contact sheets because we also have a lot with the X's, oh, which is unique because all Was the that, other... Did David put those X's yeah. on that? Yeah, because oh, okay. Terry wouldn't, you know, yeah. um, mark up his necks really. I mean, occasional sticker. Yeah. Um, but yeah, really so... Using these ever. <laughs> right, yeah, and here, here it is. Definitely not these <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. But interesting that that he would do that. That he would take take the time yeah. um, uh, uh, to help select yeah. what he liked. Yeah, I mean David was very free in. I mean, the uh, Lodger album, for example, which Derek Bosher designed. David said to Derek, "Do it for the um, gatefold. Do what you want." But. He was very he'd let people have free reign, but he knew exactly what he wanted, you know. Well, so. and he chose wisely in in many ways too, in terms of yeah. who he was going to collaborate with, yeah. whether it be photographer, or art director, or yeah. illustrator, artist. Yeah, yeah. 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 David yeah. knew exactly what that person could bring to him, and how that would in like just increase the amplification of what he was doing. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. There's, there's something comes up with screen. It's it's an um, an enemy award. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Music week. Yeah. And uh, he gets second. I know. It's, what, it's, what on earth beat that iconic picture? It was Pink Floyd. Oh, was it? Yeah. Uh, Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, I think. Uh, I think it was. Yeah. 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 My favorite session, I think, has to be the pictures taken in White Sands, New Mexico, just because being a photographer and working in an analog world, I understand the risk stuff he took. He was there to shoot pictures for the Sunday Times on, to, to cover The Man Who Fell to Earth, Nick Rogue's film. And he said to David, you know, let's, can we get out of town and do something different? And David agreed um, they'd go down to White Sands, where Oppenheimer let off the bomb, and it's just an incredible visual. And New Mexico is an, an extraordinary anyway. I mean, it's just so dynamic. Big skies, just the weather patterns, the fauna, the 
wildlife, everything is incredible. It's just really engaging. Um, and um, so they got down there late. David got up late. Jeff pulled David out of bed, and they got it was only about a three or four hour drive down to um, White Sands. And by the time they got down there, the sun was just starting to go down. Duffy didn't have an assistant. He didn't have any Polaroid. And he used uh, two techniques. One was he had this Russian camera called a Horizont, which uh, when you fired the shutter, it went zzz like that. It took like a double 35, which is really quite unique. So he shot some pictures on that camera. And then he had this little triangular frame with three Panasonic flashlights on, the size of a flashlight you put on a domestic 35mm camera. And he'd connected it to this box that when you turned it, it fired the flashes off at the speed that you turned the knob. So you could go flash, 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 or flash, 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 or however fast you did it. So as the sun was going down, he said to David, stand really, really still and just move one part of your body, giving it a second exposure. So David would stand still, David would move his hand, and Duffy would open the shutter and he'd go click, click, click. Now, that's really precarious. I mean, you don't know what's going to come out, okay? Today, on a digital camera, you just look at the back of it, you go, oh, no, that doesn't work, let's do this. But the sun was going down. He was leaving the next day to come back to, to London. And I just think it's just such a... And they came out, like, they were brilliant. I remember I was in the studio and we sent the pictures off to be processed and I remember looking at them on the light box thinking, wow, those are just fantastic. So from that point of view, that would be my favourite session, I think, really. I mean... Aladdin Sane is a story on its own, and Lodger is a technical feat, really, very clever. Um, so, but yeah, then what do? And also, that's one of my favourite albums, Young Americans. So it connects. Yeah, puts it all together. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, just a point about yourself, Chris. Um, because of my knowledge at the time when we worked together about how you. Yeah, it was about 83, wasn't it? Yeah. So, you know, pre-digital, etc. And I was fortunate enough to work with you, but I didn't know of your father. So oh. when I worked with you, I was actually like, oh, come on, you know, I'm Chris Duffy. Yeah. Well, I wasn't, I, I was a massive fan. Yeah. Uh, very influenced, but um, not knowledgeable about the background. So yeah. you became, for me, you were before your father. Yeah. And actually, I've got to say, <coughs> out of all the photographers I worked with, Obviously, David Levine and, um, you know, that, all of you around at that time. Peter Ashworth. Peter, I worked yeah. with Peter. Peter times. was great, yeah. Yeah, lovely fellow. Yeah. Um, but the picture you captured of me totally captured me as the, at that point, more so than probably anyone else. And when I found out who your father was, it all made sense. <laughs> it was that cool. Funnily enough, thinking about <clears throat> where we took that picture, that exact spot would be where Aladdin Sane was shot. Right. On that end of the studio, in that in that that's position right. there. So that's... that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just wanted you to know that. that yeah. Was, um... Well, he did, Duffy had gone to New York. At that point, he'd, um, he'd gone to work in... Uh, he, he was directing commercials as well out of New York. So I that was his studio originally, yeah, that's right. that's and right. I, I took it over. Any other questions? Just one little question. Is it right that Duffy once taught art at Loughton College? No, he didn't teach at Loughton, but he might have gone there to um, to do a guest event. But I don't, he didn't, not, not as a job, no. I can tell you something about that, actually. Go on. Because I taught at Loughton College. Oh, OK. And there was a guy called Phil Duffy, yeah. who was the graphics man. And everyone used to say, "Is that you, Phil?" Yeah. And he would never let on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he, he would just smile. So we thought, "That's him. It's Phil who did this cover." You know. Oh, it's and, brilliant. And he let us be. You know, like we. And then I thought, "Oh, you know, later on, I know he wasn't." Yeah, yeah. Let that go forever. So I think that's yeah, yeah, he was dining out on it for a while. <laughs> There's a similar kind of uh, parallel there when. 
we lived in King Henry's Road and before Duffy got the big studio at 1518, we lived in the basement and he had the, the, the front room as his studio and the back room as the dressing room and office. And then downstairs in the basement, there was this like little extra adjunct where he had a dark room. And he'd taken um, a guy called Norman Brand from Vogue to become his printer. And Norman was the spitting image of Hank Marvin. I mean, you could not tell them apart. And as a kid, I always thought Hank Marvin was working for my dad in the darkroom, and at night he went and played with the shadows. <laughs> anyway. We all need a day job. Yeah, we all need a day job. Yeah, yeah. Um, any other questions? Um, the thing he said about rescuing films and the discovering art, and that is sort of remind me the Swedish artist. He 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 went into China to rescue films that were undeveloped in yeah. the 80s, but those are like total strangers to him, but he would just sort of, in anthropology, this, that concept is like the rise of process where you giving something another value than its physical form. So for you, uh, as he said, you, we went through the archive with Duffy, but how would you actually go, go through something like perhaps you're less familiar, like the archive? I guess it depends what you're trying to find, really. I mean, there's, archives have different <clears throat> um, values if it's from a historical point of view. I mean, for example, we've <clears throat> found a load of pictures taken in Hong Kong in 69, and I'm going to put a little book together, HK69, just of, they're not groundbreaking Cartier, Bressel, reportage type pictures, but from a historical point of view, they punctuate a certain period. And what's so fascinating, there's, there's, the streets are still there, Victoria Street and whatever. And it's about the time change between now and then, 50 years. So in that context, they have, have a value. But if you're looking for um, Vivian Meyer, for example, type pictures, then in a photographer, then you're, you're, use, you're looking for different things. I guess it depends on it's the end outcome. What are, you, what are you looking for, really? But again, time, any pictures. I mean, if you see pictures of Piccadilly in the 1900s, it may not be a great picture, but it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I, lo so. I love, that's my favorite thing, is finding, yeah. you know, online, et cetera, uh, yeah. photos of Soho yeah. um, from the 50s or 60s, yeah. just to like look at the shops and yeah. that's two eyes and yeah. that was heaven and hell. But again, you know, with this thing I say about this paradigm shift between analog and digital is that you believe that because it was a period where, I mean, there's an interesting, I mean, Duffy was a renowned advertising photographer as well. And one of uh, the great images I think he did, uh, well, he, d he did three fantastic images for Smirnoff Vodka. <clears throat> One of them was um, a skydiving picture. We went up to um, the Dales in uh, Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, and there was a little airfield there that was high up on uh, a bluff, and it dropped off. It was a short airfield, so when the planes took off, they dipped down like that, and then they took off like that. So I don't know if anyone ever remembers this ad, but it was a picture of three skydivers with parachutes on, flares, and a girl in a black neoprene swimsuit with flippers, goggle and mask, and a vodka <coughs> martini. And the strap line for Shimon of them was anything is possible, okay? So we had a rig built with four poles with flat plates on that we winched the skydivers on. Now remember, it was like 40 feet down, okay? No safety net. And from where we were standing, it looked like we were half a mile up in the, in the sky. We had a Volkswagen engine uh, with a propeller on at the bottom of the uh, bluff, blowing up air. So when they lit the flares, you got it, so it looked like they were falling through the sky. And of course, the girl had no parachute, okay. We shot 
I'm incredibly brave. So health and safety today, you'd be arrested. You couldn't do that kind of thing. But actually, you wouldn't need to because you just do it on Photoshop, okay? Um, and we shot about a roll and a half of film on 6x9. Um, incredibly brave girl. I don't know how she did it. Rushed back to London, got the film process. They blew it up to 10x8, and a company called Ronchetti and Day, pre-Photoshop, touched out the poles, okay? And it went out on 48 sheet posters in the underground, in magazines. And people saw that picture and it's like, how did they do that? Did she fall in a net? Did someone give her a parachute? Because intrinsically your belief system was that a photograph didn't lie. Believe anything now, yeah. right? That's true, that's true. Yeah, yeah, so. Well, speaking of photographs, I wanted to uh, uh, ask you what's in that little secret case of yours there. Well, I've actually got something the, yeah. very special. For everyone who's made it out tonight and this is the first time I've done this I actually brought with me the original camera that Aladdin Sane and Scary Monsters were shot on and it still works charged it up and it's old. Um, but I'm going to put it on a tripod. I'm going to face it in front of an Aladdin same picture and you're quite welcome to look through and you will see what Duffy saw. Oh my God. Very, very that picture. That's never been done before so that's a, a unique experience. Well thank I mean this entire night it's been a very unique experience and uh, I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time to come down and to do this to thank everyone here for coming along um, again thanks the, the staff um, you're you're sticking around for a bit so everyone can yeah. look at that amazing camera that you brought down yeah. you've got books you can you can buy you can sign I'm sure there's more Duffy I see some prints in the back that people can buy yeah we've got um, lots of bits all sorts of bits yeah. yeah but thank you all very much appreciate thank it you.